This episode of All In with Pastor Jordan Easley has been made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. Welcome to All In with Pastor Jordan Easley. Today's message is about to begin, and we invite you to prepare your heart and mind to hear an inspiring message from God's Word. We hope and pray for God to speak to you today as you seek to live your life all in for Jesus Christ. And now, from First Baptist Church in Cleveland, Tennessee, here is Pastor Jordan Easley. Well, hey, today we are launching a brand new sermon series that I'm calling You Asked For It. And over the next month or so, I'm going to be really addressing some of the most requested subjects that we've received over the last year or so. And uh, let me start by just giving you kind of a target statement to get us started. Are you ready? The target statement is this. The Bible, go ahead. The Bible isn't just an ancient book that spotlights sin. It's the voice of God that points us to the Son of God who came to take away our sin. If you agree with that, say amen. That's what the Bible is. It's the voice of God. You know, we live in a world today where many people are asking the question, who am I? And what we've learned is that when this is the question that's being asked in our culture, there are many sources that are quick to offer an answer. I learned a new term this week. The term is identity disturbance. Now, this is a term used to describe what many are calling a personality disorder, but really it's where a person experiences a deficiency in maintaining an identity. A deficiency in maintaining an identity. What does that mean? It means when someone asks the question, who am I? They're left with their head spinning because they're unable to answer the question. That they don't know who they are. Today, when a teenager is asking the question, who am I? Here's the way it works. They feel like this person today, but then they may feel like someone completely different tomorrow. And not only that, but they've got parents saying, you're this. And they've got teachers saying, you're that. And they've got coaches saying this. And you have friends expecting that. And, and their heads are spinning and they're like, who am I? I don't know. And it's leaving people confused. And yet when you open, open up the Bible and you ask that same question of God, you say, who am I? God, God tells us very clearly in Psalm 139, 14, I am fearfully and wonderfully made by God, right? And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, I have been bought with a price. I belong to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says I'm a member of Christ's body. In Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, he says, I have been chosen by God. I'm adopted as a child of God. So when it comes to identity, it's like God says one thing and the world says many things. And you wonder why people are so confused. When our kids were little, our crew was watching a TV show as a family. And there was one particular episode that kind of caught us off guard. When they introduced this character that was a trans character and they began to spotlight and really celebrate their personal journey of transitioning from being a woman to becoming a man. And this individual shared their story and, and as they did, I looked over at my nine and 10 year old kids at the time and I saw an expression on their face I had never seen before. It was like their eyes were bugging out of their head. They were hearing something for the first time that really made absolutely no sense to them. And in that moment, my wife Audra and I, we knew and we realized if we don't have this conversation now and teach our kids God's truth about gender and identity and sexuality, our kids are going to be educated on these topics and they're going to hear it from other sources that we don't really want speaking into our kids' lives. So for that reason, I believe these conversations are important for the church to have. People are asking the question, who am I? People are confused on the subject of uh, who was I created to be? And you know what? God has all the answers that we as people are looking for. And so why wouldn't we open it up and be honest about what God says about these subjects? Get this in your notes today, if you will. Who I am isn't determined by how I feel or who others expect me to be. Who I am is determined by the God who created me. Who I am is determined by the God who created me. He is Yahweh. He is Elohim. He is the creator of the universe and everything in it. Genesis 1.1 is clear. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And yet what many people don't realize is his role as our creator goes far beyond just creating the heavens and the earth. Today, we're going to see that he's the designer behind everything, including these subjects. 
He's the designer behind gender and identity and sexuality. He's the designer behind all of it. God is the designer of gender. He's the architect behind male and female. And this goes, this goes back to the very beginning in the book of Genesis. Genesis 1.27 says, so God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. In this passage, you see the genesis of gender. Gender was God's idea. See, the world's trying to convince our culture today that these terms, male and female, are simple cultural constructs. But the truth is, these terms were significant parts of God's creation and his blueprints of mankind. He tells us two very specific things here about his creation of us. He tells us, first of all, we were created in God's image. And secondly, we were created either a male or a female. And that's exciting for me, right? Because it tells me that as a male, there are aspects of God's image reflected in who I am. If you're a man here today, there's, there's the image of God that is embedded in who you are. And if you're a female, guess what? The same is true. You are made in God's image. You say, well, that's Old Testament stuff. I don't believe all that. Jesus never said it. Yes, he did. He actually said the same thing in Matthew 19, 4. That says, haven't you read the scriptures? And Jesus replied, they record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. So this was God's design. We were created in God's image. We were created as males and females, and he created us this way with great intentionality so that we would reflect him to the world so that we could also relate to him as our heavenly father. But this goes on. He also created us male and female so that we could relate with one another. I'm talking about within the context of biblical marriage. Now, if you're taking notes today, I'm going to share with you two big words today. The first word I want you to jot down is the word egalitarian. Egalitarian. When you say that word, you can almost hear the word equal when you say it out loud, which is really what egalitarian means. It's this idea that men and women are the exact same and equal. Not one over the other, not one stronger and not one weaker, but equal in positions, equal in roles, and equal in responsibilities. It's the egalitarian viewpoint. Now, there's a second viewpoint I want you to jot down, and that is complementarian. Complementarian. And what that means is men and women complement one another. That's where a man looks at his wife and says, man, God gave that woman superpowers that I as a man just simply don't have. And if you're married today, you understand what I'm talking about, right? This is where we look at someone of the opposite sex or gender and we recognize they are the completion of everything that I'm not. When I look at my wife, Audra, it's very easy to do that, right? It's easy to say, uh, you know, this woman is strong in areas where I'm weak. But on the flip side of that, it's also easy to see where in areas where I may be stronger, she may be weaker. And that's okay, because that's how God designed us to work as man and woman, as husband and wife, to complement one another. And when that's the case, and one man and one woman enter one marriage, we become much stronger than we could ever be as just an individual set apart. And that's the beauty of gender. That's why a man and a woman were designed to come together. And that's been God's design since the very beginning. God made us either a male or a female. And when he did, he made us different from one another. And yet he made us for one another, which is pretty incredible as well. God is the designer of gender. But I want you to see next, God is also the one who founded the foundation of the family. God founded the foundation of the family. And the Bible gives us great clarity regarding his design, especially when it comes to the roles and responsibilities that we were given associated with our gender. When you look at the Bible, there's no question regarding a boy or a girl, a male or a female, and our roles. In fact, in the Bible, a boy becomes a man, a man becomes a husband, a husband becomes a father every single time. A girl becomes a woman, a woman becomes a wife, a wife becomes a mother. 
The Bible uses terminology that identifies who we are and who we were created to be. With terms like son or daughter or boy or girl or brother or sister or young man or young woman. You say, Jordan, this is very, very basic stuff that you're teaching us today. Exactly. Unfortunately, today we got to go back to the basics. We've got to remember God's design because people are confused today and the basics of the Bible have been forgotten. Listen, we live in a confused world. If you're tracking with me, say amen. Check your pulse. Check the person next to you. Make sure they're awake, right? The Bible talks about this. So why aren't we, why aren't we preaching it? The Bible talks about us being mother-in-laws and father-in-laws and aunts and uncles and bridegrooms and brides and kings and queens. The Bible speaks with great intentionality when it comes to our gender as well as our roles and our responsibilities in the family. He goes on to talk about this in Ephesians 5 related to us in marriage. He said, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Verse 25 goes on to say, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. In this passage, he shows husbands being positionally designed to be the leaders of their homes. And he also teaches that we ought to be people that love their wives as Christ loved the church. He goes on to use this analogy where he says that Jesus is the groom and the church, we are the bride. And this is where all the dudes in the room are like, man, I'm not okay with being the bride. Okay, I don't want to be the, well, just hang on for a second. Because it's just terminology that's used to show how we're supposed to relate with one another. The Bible shows that we should be people that are serving one another and loving one another. And that we ought to be people that are, that are ultimately blessing one another, making sacrifices for one another. Why? Because that's God's design. God is the designer of what we're talking about. So if you're tracking with where we are, the first one is God is the designer of gender. We talked about the genesis of gender, and this was God's idea. The second thing we said was that God founded the foundation of the family. He created us male and female. He gave us different roles and responsibilities in the home. But the next thing I want you to see is that God is the inventor of intimacy. God is the inventor of intimacy. Genesis 1, 28 says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And what that tells us is in addition to God creating us in his image and in addition to God creating us male and female, he also brings us together for a purpose. Part of that purpose, not the entire purpose, but part of that purpose is to fill the earth, like the Bible says. In modern day language, it's to make babies, amen. The purpose is procreation. And I realize that many of us probably didn't have these conversations growing up, but there are a few things that the Bible teaches us about sex that I think are good to, to note today. The first one is this, sex was designed by God to be good. You say, Jordan, we didn't, we didn't talk about this in my house. Man, I grew up in a home that always said that sex is bad. Well, guess what? Sex is not bad. Sex is not bad at all. Sex, sin is bad. Amen. I mean, it's not sex is bad. Sin is bad. Now we can mess it up real easy, but God created sex and he called it good. Remember sex was created uh, for procreation, but it was also created for pleasure. In fact, the Bible says in Genesis 2, 25, that both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. So remember, before the fall, before sin ever entered the picture, sex was a part of the created order, and the Bible says the created order was good. In fact, if you want to get real technical, God said it was real good. It was very good. And it was designed to be something that husbands and wives engage in freely and without inhibitions of any kind. When sex happens according to God's plan, it's not something that should lead us to shame. Remember, before sin entered the picture, you got Adam and Eve, they're running around, running around naked, they're having a great time, they're enjoying the blessings of God and the bounty of God. I mean, it was perfect, that's the way that God created it to be. It was awesome. But then what happened? As soon as sin entered the picture, they stepped into sin, what happened? They immediately what? They covered up their private parts. They started picking leaves off the trees and weaving together stuff. And now all of a sudden they're wearing outfits. They're covering everything up. They're hiding from God. Why? Their sin led them to shame. It was the sin that led to the shame. 
When sex happens according to the context of marriage and it happens according to God's plan, it's not something that should be shameful and embarrassing. It's something that should be cherished and enjoyed as a gift from God. See, in the Bible, God gives us a vivid picture of that design. He, he shows us there's a man and there's a woman and there's a marriage and there's intimacy. And according to God's plan, it's very good. And he shows us when we follow his blueprints and, and operate according to his design, it's honoring to God. It brings glory to God. It's something that God wants to bless. But on the flip side of that, when we forego his plans... When we step outside of his design, the Bible gives us a completely different picture. What did it say a second ago in Hebrews 13, verse 4? It says, marriage is to be honored by all and the marriage bed kept undefiled because God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. We, we don't like to talk about this part. But God repeatedly reminds us that he will not and cannot turn a blind eye to sexual sin. He just can't because he's holy. And by the way, when God says that he will judge those in sexual sin, he's not just talking about people who engage in the sexual sins that you personally disagree with. He's not just talking about the sexual sins that you personally don't struggle with. And let me just give you a, a fair warning. Next week, we're going to continue this message in far greater detail. And we're going to talk specifically about some of the things that we're facing in our culture today. And as we do, we're going to unpack a couple of verses in 1 Corinthians 6 that say this. Don't you know that the, the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And sometimes when we read isolated verses like this, we begin to think that these are the only sins that are going to be judged by God. But when you read the entire Bible, you quickly realize that this is not a comprehensive list of all the sexual sins that God speaks to. God's word speaks of things like lust and fornication and adultery and rape and incest and homosexuality and bestiality. He talks about pornography and pagan sexual activity in the name of God. I mean, there's a long list, if you want to get comprehensive, in which God speaks to. And in, in God's plan and according to God's scripture, it says that God will judge those who forego his plans and choose to take their own path. We live in a day where there are many misconceptions about sex. Misconceptions about sex. Listen, the Bible clearly says in, in very bold letters that God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. I read this week in Galatians 6 verse 7, it says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. And yet we live in a world that is mocking God. We're mocking God's plans for these things. And we ought to be expecting something. It says, for whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. Listen, from the very beginning, God's love has been consistent. He is love. His mercy has been consistent. He is full of mercy. His grace has been consistent. I mean, you go all the way back to the very beginning. He's never wavered on his grace. But you know something else that God has been consistent with since the very beginning? He, he's been consistent with his message. He's been consistent with the truth. He doesn't change his perspective on, on, on these things or really anything. From the very beginning, God has been consistent, and he's been consistent with letting us know that we can choose either path. He said from the beginning, you can choose the path of sin. You can choose the path of rebellion. But he's also been very clear to say that, that, that if you take that path, it's going to lead to a place of destruction. You, you can choose today to take a path that doesn't honor God. You can choose to, to walk in a way that is a completely out of, his, out of his will and away from his design. But he wants you to know through his word that that path is going to lead to a, a, a place that you don't want to be. But there's another path that God talks about, not just a path of sin, there's a path of righteousness. 
And he said, you can take this path of righteousness and you can live your life according to God's plan. You can live your life according to God's design. And that path, it leads to another place, a place of blessing and abundance. And that's only possible in Christ and through Christ. So get that imagery in your mind. You have two paths. One of them leads to a horrible place. One of them leads to the God who created you. And here's the crazy thing. The Bible says that every single one of us, every single one of us knows what it's like to take the path of sin because we've all walked that road. We've all made decisions that don't honor God. And yet, even though we've walked that road, God has a message for us today. In Isaiah 53, 6, it says, we all went away astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way. I'm reminded of what Paul told the Romans. He said, we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Listen to me, if you feel guilty because of the sin in your life today, you shouldn't because you're just like all of us. We're all in the same, in the same place. We all know what it's like to sin and fall short of the glory of God. There's a lot of different ways that we try to escape our brokenness. And we do that as people that want to be fixed. But when you read the Bible, let me give you a little bit more truth. There's nothing that you can do that will change the way God looks at the sin in your life. Nothing you can do. But there is something that Jesus can do. There is something that Jesus can do. What does it say in Romans 6, 23? It says, for the wages of sin is death. That's where we're headed if we're in our sin. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You can't do anything to change your eternal destination, but Jesus has already done everything that was required. His sacrifice on the cross was enough to cover your sin and to change you from the inside out. You know what? He not only erases your sin, he changes your heart. And when you turn to Jesus, there's a process called sanctification where you can become more like the God who saved you. Listen, if you want to know the answer, the only way to reconstruct what sin deconstructs is the gospel. The only way to reconstruct what sin deconstructs is the gospel. And that's true when a person is initially saved, but it's also true when a saved person slips up and starts walking the wrong path again. Guess what? The gospel is the only thing that can get you back on your feet and chasing Jesus once again. You know what it's like to feel broken? Of course you do. All of us do. Let me show you this next slide, if you will. All of us know what brokenness looks like because all of us have experienced it in our life. And you know what? There was God's design, and we talked about that all morning. God designed perfection. He designed something where all of us want to be there, but we're incapable of being perfect because of one thing, and that is sin. You see, this little sin right here, that has made us where we left God's perfect design and we pursued brokenness. We didn't mean to pursue brokenness, but this was the destination we found ourselves. And because we don't want to be broken, we were made in God's image. We have a desire for God's very best. We try to escape it on our own, in our own way. This is the religion. This is the behavior modification. This is whatever I can do to cope and make myself feel better. This is drugs and alcohol and addiction and pursuing relationships and trying to be a better person. We try hard to escape brokenness, but there's nothing that you can do in and of yourself to feel the completion that God designed you to crave. You see, the Bible shows that we were we, that God had a perfect design. Our sin led us to brokenness, and the only way to pursue God once again is the gospel. You see, that word gospel could also be Jesus. That word gospel means the good news. Jesus came, and he, he came as the Son of God, and he lived on planet Earth. He was God the Son and the Son of God, and he came perfect as the Messiah. He died on the cross for the sins of the world. He did what only he could do to save people like me and to save people like you. But he didn't stay dead in the grave. What happened? He rose again to prove that he truly was the Son of God. And in doing so, he allowed our sins to be forgiven. He allowed us to enter a real relationship through him, which allowed us to be seen as righteous in the eyes of God, even though we're messed up and that we were once broken. You see, at this point, when you say yes to Jesus and go all in with him, it allows you to be on this new journey, this new journey of pursuing God's perfection once again. And there's going to be a day where the children of God will live with him in eternity in a perfect place called heaven. I don't know about you. I'm grateful that God met me at my point of need. I'm grateful that I'm not defined by my sins today and that God said, you 
you will be my son in heaven. Listen, there may be somebody here today that said, I've never done that. I've never said yes to Jesus. I've tried all of these different ways, but I've never been able to step into a real healing, saving relationship through Christ. I've never been forgiven of my sins. I don't know what it's like to live in freedom with the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, but I want to do that right now. There may be somebody right now that says, this is why God has me here. We're not talking about sexual sin. We're talking about all sin because we're all sinners in need of a Savior. If you need a Savior today, I'm going to invite you to say yes to Christ. Would you just bow your head, close your eyes? You say, Jordan, I mean business with God. I want to know him today. Would you just tell him, Jesus, I need you? Would you just say that to him right now? Jesus, I need you. I need you to save me. I need you to change me. I need you to make me new. Tell Jesus today, I'm willing to turn my back on my sin. The things I've been chasing, I will no longer chase. And today I turn my back and I chase you as my Savior and my Lord. I give you complete control of who I am. I want to be a son or a daughter of the King. I want to live forever in freedom, beginning right now, never to be the same again. God, give me the courage to live for you. Give me the courage to follow you all the days of my life. And allow my flag for Christ to be raised in this moment and for every day for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. This episode of All In with Pastor Jordan Easley has been made possible by the generous support of viewers like you. We hope and pray for God to speak to you today as you seek to live your life all in for Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 12, verse 33, Jesus said, sell your possessions and give to the poor. For many years, I would read verses like this one and I would find ways to justify my disobedience because for a long time, I wasn't thinking about the poor. I wasn't using what God had given me to help resource people that were stuck in poverty. If I'm being honest, I've been a tither to my church and I've, I've given to missions, but even as a pastor and a Bible-believing Christian, there have been times when I wasn't leveraging my God-given blessings to be a blessing to others, not in the way that I should. What I love about Compassion International is they give people like us the opportunity to partner with them in being the hands and feet of Jesus to real people that are stuck in real poverty in real places around the world. And for just $38 a month, just a little over a dollar a day, my family is given the opportunity to not only provide food and sustenance to kids that are hungry and not only provide the funds that are necessary for a child to go to school, but I'm partnering with a gospel-centered ministry that puts real people on the ground. Missionaries that love the Lord and are living on mission and building relationships. Compassion International is representing us as we seek to live out the Great Commission. They're building bridges between people who need the Lord and Bible-based churches in these communities so that these children can hear about Jesus and grow in their faith. Our family sponsors two kids in Nairobi, Kenya. Their names are Jabril and Zakia. And not long ago, I had the privilege of flying to their hometown and meeting my two Compassion kids face to face. I met their families, we kicked a soccer ball, we shared a Coke, and they thanked me over and over again, not for sponsoring them, but for loving them. If you'd like more information on how you can join in this mission, right now you can send a text. You can text the word COMPASSION to 74784, or you can click the COMPASSION link on our website at goallin.tv. I can promise you this. You can't spend $38 in a more effective or more mission-minded way than this.